Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, May 6th, 2020. And today we're talking about militarized police. A lot of people think this is just a local or a state problem and that the feds need to come in and protect themselves, protect their liberty from some local tyrant, some governor, some mayor, some law enforcement officer locally. But if you follow the money, we know that old phrase, if you follow the money, it's very easy to see that the federal government has been funding and building this system on a local level for years, if not decades. So I'm going to go over today some of the main programs that the federal government uses to turn your local peace officers into militarized federal law enforcement agents, a national militarized police state from funding, task forces, and more. I've got articles from Mike Meharry and TJ Martinell. Some, I actually even forgot about some of the work that they did five, six years ago that's really, really good. Uh, I believe I've got something to go over from John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute, a report from the ACLU, The Intercept, and more. Pretty interesting, broad range of information. First of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center, one of the epicenters of the militarized police state. We've got a bunch of live video platforms that we're on. We stream live on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, DLive, and Twitch. We have archive video versions at Brighteon, BitChute, Library, and BitTube.tv. And I'm going to add more as there's good ones out there. I was thinking about Voice.com at some point. And then we also have audio-only podcast editions. I've seen a bunch of new reviews come in on iTunes. I'm really, really grateful for that because it tells iTunes that they should show the program to more people. And I think as long as we're consistent on this over the years, we're going to reach a lot more people in that platform. There's also Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, and elsewhere. You can find all of our archives, all the individual episodes and show notes for and links to stuff that I'm talking about. So all the articles I'm covering today, I'm going to include links because I really want you to read more. You should, because basically I'm researching and studying as I go here, and you can basically learn the same things that I'm learning you could probably do the same show and explain this type of thing to more people. So I include all those links so you can read and learn more. You can find all the platforms that we're on, video and audio. You can find our social media channels to follow us, our news newsletter from email, plus our membership program where you can support us and make sure we keep the lights on and expanding from little as from as little as two bucks a month. All that's on the show homepage over at 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty. Again, 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty. I want to say hello to some of the uh, people out in the live chat. I'm really grateful for you joining me today. Tyler B., Bob Landry, Heather Rossi, Anna Rays, Liberty Fowl on YouTube, over on Facebook, Justin Morrison, always good to see you. Victor Jeffcoat, great quote, none are hel as helplessly enslaved as those who falsely believe they are free. Who did that quote? I've heard that many times. It's a really good one. Patricia Dance, good to see you. I, I don't know if you saw my comment in the live chat yesterday at the end of the, or Monday at the end of the show. I know you have an email that you sent over sometime last week. I'm just a little behind schedule on that, but I'm definitely going to get back to you soon, Patricia. Thank you. Michael Lohr, Justin Bayola, Nathaniel Dobbins, Nightmaster, good to see you. Kyle Reese over on Periscope says, thugs, you got that right. Uh, Michael Bogus, good to see you. Essential Freedom uh, out in Missouri. And Connie Nicotra, Kyle Berg. Man, really good to see you guys. Dennis and Namalia and everyone else. See our show. I, I'm sorry if I missed anybody. I liked saying hello to everybody, acknowledging you spending time with me. Because when I first started this organization, my goal back in 2006, when I registered the domain name, 10thamendmentcenter.com, a little inside scoop. I also registered at the time, and I don't have them anymore, I believe 5th Amendment Center and 4th Amendment Center.com. And I started blogging on each of these. My goal was like just to point out all the horrible things that government was doing, and I wanted to reach... I don't know, four, five people, one person, just because I wanted to express myself. I felt it was my duty to say things. And so the, I still have that kind of mentality, even though we reach so many more people today. We're far from where we need to be. So to me, every time I see somebody out there listening, uh, engaging, whatever, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Enough sappy stuff. Let's get right to this. And I think we're all seeing more and more images of police looking like, 
I don't know, they're raiding Fallujah in Iraq. They, you know, just dealing with day-to-day -day things like protests. And as I was looking at some pictures from Sacramento over the weekend, for those of you who are watching the video, this is a pretty interesting one, full riot gear with the knee pads and face masks and, and N95s under it and bulletproof vests to deal with nonviolent, probably non-armed protests in Sacramento. I'm like, man, this is a real problem. And some people seem to think that this is a new thing, and it only comes from the state level, so that California is evil. Well, the California government is evil. So is the Michigan government, so is the Oklahoma government, so is uh, the Texas government. Every single government is attacking your liberty at some level or another. Even if you happen to like the politicians who are running the show, None of them are actually good. But when it comes to this militarized police state, a lot of people just want to, they're focusing in the wrong area. Of course, it's good to actually, the people who are doing it, it's good to point out the problem there. But if you don't cut off the source, it's just going to continue to grow unabated. And here from a great article from TJ Martinell, let me switch this over so you can see my mug here. This is an article that TJ wrote back in 2014. I forgot about this one as I was, until I did the research for this last night and this morning. He put it this way, and this was in response to the uh, issues in Ferguson in Missouri. He says, with the sight of cops in Ferguson, Missouri, and Boston resembling totalitarian warriors out of a stereotypical dystopian novel, many Americans have become alarmed at the apparent transition of law enforcement to a role as an occupation force. They also wonder where the police got the money to pay for it. Now, I think we could just put that same statement today. Maybe we change the locations. But there are people looking at this and saying it's a problem. Unfortunately, and just a quick side note, the people who are opposed to it today, many, well, there are those of us who are consistently opposed to a militarized, nationally, federally driven police state, uh, asset forfeiture, drug war, surveillance, and all that consistently, no matter who's in power. But a lot of the people out there who were opposed to it then seem to have no problem with it now. And other people who are opposed to it now seem to have no problem with it then. We need to build more consistency and focus on the principles. That's just a quick side note. TJ goes on. He says, according to the Center for Investigative Reporting, now mind you, this was about six years ago, five and a half. He says, the answer is that most of it comes from the federal government. Most of the funding comes from the federal government. Without it, what would they do? In the past decade alone, TJ writes, police departments throughout the country have received a total of $34 billion in federal grants. Now, this is not federal grants for everything. This is federal grants for policing, and that's a lot of money. And what do you think they're gonna do with it? Surprise, surprise, all kinds of bad stuff. Well, there are three major federal funding programs. There's more, but the three big ones, I want to review these. This is from some testimony from the ACLU uh, back a few years ago. And surprisingly, because they generally like centralization of power over there, on this, they actually get the messaging right. They said, the militariz militarization of American policing has occurred as a result of federal programs that use equipment transfers and funding to encourage aggressive enforcement of the war on drugs by state and local police agencies. Let's say that again. And for those of you who hate the ACLU, let's pretend it was the Heritage Foundation saying this. They wouldn't, but let's pretend. The militarization of American policing has occurred as a result of federal programs that use equipment transfers and funding to encourage aggressive enforcement of the war on drugs by state and local police agencies. I'll say it one more time with my twist. The unconstitution of, unconstitutional militarization of American policing has occurred as a result of unconstitutional federal programs that use unconstitutional equipment transfers and unconstitutional funding to encourage aggressive enforcement of the unconstitutional war on drugs. That's really what it gets down to. There's tons of layers. It's a giant onion, not Trek style, but a giant onion of layers of unconstitutional programs, grants, funding, enforcement programs that shouldn't exist. And the result is really, really bad. The first main program that most people know about is the Department of Defense 1033 program. That's the most well-known one. We heard about that a lot back in the Ferguson time. The 1033 program, they write, launched in the, this is ACLU again, launched in the late 1980s during the height of the so-called war on drugs, authorizes the Department of Defense, this was late 89 or so, 
authorizes the Department of Defense to transfer military equipment to local law enforcement agencies. This program, enacted as part of the 1989 National Defense Authorization Act, those of you who guys know about the NDAA, year in and year out, it's a real problem and they always sneak in more garbage that shouldn't exist. Enacted as part of the 1989 NDAA, initially authorized the transfer of equipment that was suitable for use by such agencies in counter-drug activities. So the federal government is basically leaning on law enforcement locally to act as federal agents, to work on federal priorities, federal law enforcement instead of being local police officers. There's a big difference between the two, and although I'm not linking to it or covering it really today, there's a great article that we published this morning by Sam Jacobs, who is uh, one of the, if not the head dude, over at Ammo.com. And they don't just write about the right to keep and bear arms. They write about broad liberty issues because it all ties in. And he did a great overview of the history of these federal programs and talking about the difference. He has a whole section covering the difference between being a peace officer and a law enforcement agent. It's a huge difference. Going further back to ACLU, they say, in addition, equipment transferred under the 1033 program is free to receiving agencies. And significantly, 36% of the property transferred recently was brand new. A lot of times I've heard from people, oh, you know, well, they've got all this gear they've used in, in warfare. I mean, what are they going to do? Just let it sit there? It's old and deprecated. But that's bull. That's a lie. This is not what's going on. They're transferring brand new stuff. So it's really a funding program. It's a, it's a grifter program. I don't know. It's for lobbyists to be able to buy more equipment. And then it's also causing the local agencies, because they like getting the stuff, they like getting the grants. It drives them to focus on federal priorities rather than local uh, law enforcement, local peace officer actions. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. Going further, they say, today the 1033 program includes more than 17,000 federal and state law enforcement agencies from all U.S. states and territories. No one can avoid this. The amount of military equipment being used by local and state police agencies has increased dramatically. The value of equipment transferred through the program went from $1 million in 1990 to $324 million in 95, and about a half a billion in 2013. I don't have the most recent numbers handy, but I will link in the show notes where they kind of break it all down. And I really didn't dig into that reporting, but maybe someone else can do that at some point. I'm sure it just keeps growing. That's what they always do. Government always grows, always grows at the expense of our liberty. And mind you, they're ripping us off. They're basically stealing money from us. They call it taxation. They're also stealing our purchasing power. They call it uh, quantitative easing or bailouts or economic stimulus, but all that stuff reduces our, our, our purchasing power, or they just steal our property, which is our, our money itself. And then, I mean, it's really not money, it's fiat, but whatever, we'll call it that. And then we have to pay for it. We're basically being ripped off to pay for our own oppression. It's pretty insane. The second program is the Department of Homeland Security, the DHS grant program. This is actually the big one. And most people don't talk about that. They only focus on 1033. And a lot of the efforts that we've seen over the years, not as much now as it was back then. It should ramp up a little bit more. Maybe we should push on this more and more. But a lot of the efforts to actually opt out of these programs specifically cite the 1033 program. But if you only opt out of the 1033 program, that doesn't change anything. It just changes how they're going to get the funding to do stuff. Back to the ACLU, they say the main source of DHS funding to state and local law enforcement is the Homeland Security Grant Program and its two main components, the State Homeland Security Program, SHSP, and the Urban Area Security Initiative. And I actually may be incorrect that this is the largest one. My, at least the last time I read about it, it was really big, but let's say it isn't. It's still pretty huge and it's one of the three main ways that they're doing this. So they require them, the recipients, to dedicate a minimum of 25% to terrorism prevented prevention-related law enforcement activities. I don't know. I don't know what, like, it's security theater to me. It's really just a way to arm them up and use fear of terrorism. As John Adams, when he was the good guy back in 1776, wrote, he said, fear is the foundation of most governments. I think it's been proven that he was wrong. It's fear is the foundation of all governments. And so they use this fear that we have to have every layer of government dealing with terrorism or we're going to die. Your home is going to be blown up by some jihadi. And so therefore, 
uh, turn a blind eye to whatever this is going on because they're just protecting you. But this is a this is a total lie. So we can protect you really means so we can control you. So they go further. The stated justification for DHS grants to state and local law enforcement is to support efforts to protect against terrorism. But even DHS acknowledges that it has a larger mission, which includes ordinary law enforcement activities. They do anti-crime. They announced in 2010, so 10 years ago, an anti-crime campaign. It allows police departments to stockpile specialized equipment in the name of anti-terror anti readiness. And let's say they're just stockpiling it. We don't even know everything that they have, probably. All of a sudden they pop out, well, we've got this here, and it's a pretty serious situation with these people at the Capitol. We may just have to roll out this product. The next program is the uh, JAG program. It's called the Department of Justice, the DOJ's Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant, Byrne JAG program. And ACLU writes, DOJ plays an important role in the militarization of police through programs such as the Burn JAG program, established in 1988. So these, again, decades that they've been doing this. And at first, a lot of local agencies really didn't participate in any of these, but they just kept throwing more money. They kept offering more asset forfeiture, equitable sharing cash. And money is pretty lucrative, especially to bureaucrats and politicians. And then they hire people based on that money that they're getting. And then the general public, if you try to cut back, they oppose it because you're, you're, you're firing the boys in blue. You're cutting back the size of the police, so you must hate America. You don't want people to be safe. And it's a very hard thing to do to actually change that. Of, of course, really, the problem is the general public's perception that more law enforcement, more militarization actually creates safety, and that's really the issue here. So the general public needs to learn this so they can oppose it. But established in 1988, the JAG program, officially called the Edward Byrne Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistant, Assistance Program, provides state and local units of government with funding to improve the functioning of their criminal justice system and to enforce drug laws. Between April of 2012 and so about a year, between 2012 and 2013, JAG grantees spent 64% of their funding on law enforcement, even though it's supposedly to improve the criminal justice system, the functioning of the courts and all that. I mean, most of the stuff that the courts want to enforce and the law enforcement wants to enforce shouldn't be on the books under a state constitution or the federal constitution anyways. So that's not even a good thing, but they're really not putting, it's really not for improving the criminal justice system. It is really to ramp up law enforcement capabilities. As of 2011, there are so it's equally clear they write that the JAG funding program is being used to conduct unnecessarily aggressive activities in drug cases. Approximately 21% of all JAG funds go to task forces, federal, state, local, they call them joint task forces. And as of 2011, there were 585 of these task forces that were funded through JAG program through the JAG funding program. Now, here's how Mike Meharry put it in an article about two years ago in 2018. And this is the important thing to understand about these joint task forces. When state or local law enforcement officers join a federal task force, they are deputized as federal agents. So you've got your local peace officer, your local cop, the sheriff, whatever, because almost all these agencies are participating in some kind of multi-jurisdictional task force. When they are part of a federal task force, they are federal agents. You may think they are local law enforcement, and maybe there are more restrictive laws on the state level of what they're authorized to do or not do. In many cases, that's, that's really how it is. But they act as federal agents under federal law, and they pretty much get away with whatever. There's not a lot of reporting. There's very little oversight. You don't know. They're not keeping records of what's going on. Who knows? We've done some research about some uh, a few years ago about some partnerships and MOUs, memorandums of understanding between uh, local local law enforcement agencies in places like Tennessee and Arizona with the ATF. They sign these MOUs and the ATF says, well, we'll pay you overtime if you have to work overtime. But they're working on the clock as federal agents. So you're basically paying them to be ATF agents or DEA agents. None of these uh, agencies should exist in the first place. So Mike goes on. As a result, they then operate under the exact same parameters as an FBI or a DEA agent or ATF. That means 
They act as if they are no longer bound by state laws. And he's, this is specifically about surveillance. They actually use these task forces to ramp up local surveillance, governing surveillance. In practice, this allows cops to ignore state laws as they collect information on people in their communities and all kinds of other activities that are problematic for the Constitution and for liberty. Kyle Reese over on Periscope nails it. ATF should be a convenience store. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. That's really good. Going further, let's look at these joint task forces. We just published an article uh, in the last couple of weeks by, again, by Mike Meharry. Joint law enforcement task forces are creating a national police state. Because if all of these local agents, whether it's in Fargo or Boise or in Los Angeles, if they're acting, if they're joining these task forces and the federal government is like, well, we're going we're gonna to do this and we're doing a task force thing here and they're all acting as federal agents, you really don't have a, a true federal system. Now, federalism as a term wasn't really used by the founders. They wanted to oppose consolidation and centralization of power. Federalism really kind of came from Frankfurter on the, or what a, I think that's the guy's name, the Supreme Court. This is like the New Deal era. So it's an interesting term. So they, when you have this type of system, when local cops, local sheriffs are working for the federal government, they're no longer local. This is a national police state. And that's how Mike puts it. He says, through the proliferation of joint law enforcement task forces, the federal government is creating a national police force that operates in a legal twilight zone with little or no oversight. I would just say it's not really a legal twilight zone. Maybe it's a legal twilight zone based on the laws on the books and the case the, the case history. But really, when it comes to the Constitution, this shouldn't be happening at all. And I know Mike agrees with that. Uh, but this just wanted to be very specific so you guys weren't confused. He puts it this way. Initially, many local law enforcement agencies weren't interested in getting in bed with federal cops and were wary of aggressive tactics employed by the joint task forces. But the feds used federal grants and asset forfeiture money to bribe reticent departments and incentivize participation. And for those of you who've watched this show or read our work here at TAC for a long time, you know that there are two main asset forfeiture programs. I mean, they're civil and criminal, but if we're talking about which jurisdiction, there's the state level ones. And then when you restrict it on a state level one, there's the federal equitable sharing program, which the entire federal apparatus doesn't matter which team is in charge. They may tell you they're cutting back on it or doing better. They love this stuff. This is legalized government theft. They allow the, the cops to take stuff. And even if someone isn't convicted or even charged with a crime, they take the property and then you have to prove instead of that you're innocent and proven guilty, you're guilty until, well, the property is guilty until you prove that the property wasn't proceeds from criminal activity. Now, if there's a restriction on a state level on this, the federal program, the equitable sharing program tells local law enforcement, well, if this looks like a federal case, you're part of a federal joint task force. Well, this is just a federal case, and now you're acting as a federal agent. We're going to take the money in here at the ATF or the, uh, the DOJ, wherever, DHS, and then we're going to keep 20%. We'll dole 80% back to the local agency. So it's a really, really nasty scam that not only steals from people, but incentivizes the local law enforcement to act as federal agents. Mike goes further. He says, today you will find hundreds, literally hundreds, of joint state-federal task forces across the U.S. Just consider this list of task forces in the Pittsburgh area alone. I don't know how he got Pittsburgh. Maybe there was some research. I think he was covering Radley Balco's uh, research on this. He's got the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, Crimes Against Children Task Force, FBI Opioid Task Force, Greater Pittsburgh Safe Streets Task Force, j -Code, the Joint Criminal and Opioid Dark Net Enforcement Team, Opioid Fraud and Abuse Detection Unit, Pittsburgh Financial Crimes and Electronics Task Force, Western Pennsylvania Fugitive Task Force, Western Pennsylvania Violent Crimes Task Force. I mean, they just go on and on and on, these multi-jurisdictional ones. And I saw someone, I think it was Frank I, over on YouTube said, this is a standing army. And in essence, and I've often kind of rejected that view, but I think it really does actually rise to that level, especially the way that they're geared up. And I'll go through some of the stuff that they get. But how they act, they're not they're acting like an occupying force Oh, more and more. And if you think this is the worst it's going to get, you're nuts. It's going to keep getting worse. Mike puts it this way. As of 
December 2016, the DEA, again, that what should be a, well, the DEA should be a convenience store too. I don't know what the acronym should be, but like the ATF shouldn't exist, doesn't is not authorized under the Constitution. It oversaw or participated in 271 anti-drug task forces across the U.S. Through a program called Project Safe Neighborhood, the DOJ ran another 86 task forces in 2018. The FBI administers 160 violent gang task forces. No one seems to be running task forces against the violent gang known as the United States federal government, but that's another conversation. The U.S. Marshals run 60 fugitive task forces. The ATF oversees the National Explosives Task Force and forms task forces for specific investigations. According to Balco, Radley Balco, the U.S. Attorney General, runs 18 task forces through the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Program. I mean, there's just a lot of this stuff going on. You can read more about that. Mike did a really great job doing this research and putting it together. He points out that there are some really nasty consequences of actually having these programs, having these task forces. He says local police can, can circumvent strict state asset forfeiture laws, just like I was saying. They can circumvent them because they are no longer, once they are participating in the federal task force, once they have made a determination and contacted their, what they call very friendly, their federal partner and say, well, we think this is a federal case. Once they tell them that, they're like, okay, well, the task force is now activated. I don't know how the conversation, honestly, I've never been in purview to uh, privy to that type of information. But however it works, we'll just pretend it's a phone call. They say, okay, well, we think this is a federal drug case. Okay, well, the task force is going. So now they can circumvent state asset forfeiture laws by claiming the cases are federal in nature. And then they get up to 80% of the proceeds. And the money and power, Mike writes, that comes when local cops partner up with the feds incentivizes local police to focus on national priorities. So if they keep doing this, and there's billions and billions of dollars being handed out to keep people on the job, because if they were just focusing on local things, they probably wouldn't need as many people working for them. So it's partly a jobs program. It's partly a program to buy products and gear from favored companies, lobbyists. And then, of course, it's just unconstitutional consolidation and centralization of power. So local police then are pushed to focus on national priorities, such as the war on drugs, federal gun control, and Mike puts it in scare quotes, anti-terrorism efforts, instead of prior prioritizing more routine lo local policing, such as murder, rape, and property crime. I mean, if you ever, like I've had so many, well, not anymore, but when I lived in Hollywood, years and years ago, if you had a problem, this is when I was dumb and I still called cops when I thought I had a problem, I would call him. I remember one guy was literally some drug addict across the street from me in this neighborhood called Whitley Heights. And he was, lived across the street at these old like 1920s buildings. And so that everything's kind of noisy in the neighborhood. He thought that the dog that lived above me was mine. And he kept like screaming out the window. Then he started pounding on the door of the building, buzzing everybody till he came. And he was trying to kick in my door, trying to knock it out. So I, I called the cops. The guy's trying to like beat me up basically and confront me about this dog that I don't even have. And the cops call back like two hours later after I tell him, I'm like, look, this guy is literally trying to, it sounds like he's got a hammer. He's trying to knock my door down. They're like, hey, you guys still have a problem over there? I mean, because they're so busy doing other stuff that they shouldn't be doing, they're never available to do the stuff that you think that you'd want them to do. But I mean, I don't want them to do any of that now. I'm a little bit smarter because I don't trust them. Uh, so it's a, it's a serious problem because their priorities are all off off the chart of where it should be if we were in an ideal situation, some fantasy land. And Mike writes, we also see the influence of these task forces in the state legislative process. This is actually huge. A lot of people think that the greatest opposition to advancing liberty comes from various organizations, uh, I don't know, like anti-gun uh, anti -gun rights organizations or pro or, or whatever, pro-surveillance. It, it, to some degree, that's the case. But the most difficult organization to get past is the cops. They are the most aggressive lobbyists on state and local law enforcement, on state and local legislative process anywhere. And it happens in every single state. If you want to see a bill introduced and passed, that slows down or stops mass warrantless surveillance, stops asset forfeiture, stops the drug war, legalizes hemp farming, any of this. The first people that most aggressively promotes 
the right to keep and bear arms. It is the cop lobby unions that come out working against it. Because if they don't, they'll probably not have as much work to do for the feds. So I might put it this way. P police lobbyists often oppose warrant requirements, limits on state and local cooperation with federal surveillance, prohibitions on the state enforcement of unconstitutional federal gun control. That's one of the worst. They are terrible. Anytime we try to advance things to protect the right to keep and bear arms in any state, the cops try to stop it. Asset forfeiture reforms and other laws blocking enforcement of unconstitutional federal laws because they don't want to jeopardize it. You will see this that you don't want you would see this in testimony. They'll come out and they'll send their head lobbyists and they'll say, well, we're working very closely with our federal partners. They always say every single location. Maybe it, the wording changes, but it might put that in quotes because I think we just hear it all the time. It's an internal joke for us because it's insane. They're buddies. In other words, Mike says the relationships with their federal partners trumps the constitutions. I would just pluralize that because it's not just the federal constitution, but it's also the state constitution. I just want to point out, I'm not going to go through this. Mike also did a really good article a couple years ago on how these joint task forces allows states to skirt limits on warrantless surveillance. He's got some examples from Illinois talking about automated license plate readers and stingrays or cell site simulators. I'm going to link to that in the show notes. I really encourage you to read a little bit more on this as well. And then hear from John Whitehead. This is all the way back to 2013. So people have been working on this for a while. And I think in the last couple of years here at TAC, other than Mike and TJ and a few others, I haven't personally pushed this as much as I should. And I think the reminder of the way that I'm seeing the police act in many places lately is telling me that this really is a problem that cannot be ignored no matter what ever. So Whitehead put it this way. Why does a police department which hasn't had an officer killed in the line of duty in over 125 years in a town less than 20,000 people need tactical military vests just like the ones used by soldiers in Afghanistan? Great question. Why do they need that? If no cop has been killed in 125 years and the town is 20,000 and less, why do they need that kind of gear? They don't. He says, for that matter, why does a police department in a city of 35,000 people need a military-grade helicopter? And what possible use could police at Ohio State University have for acquiring a heavily armored vehicle intended to withstand IED blasts? Improvised electronic devices, I believe. I don't know what, what that acronym, but basically it's like a roadside bomb, like what they'd use in Iraq, the insurgents, what they would call them, or the terrorists, whatever they call them, the people fighting the military occupation of the U.S. empire. So why do these things? And if you read through this article, I'll link to it. These are great questions. They're not rhetorical. He's actually basing on examples. For example, Mon Montgomery County, Texas, the sheriff's department owns a $300,000 pilotless surveillance drone a 300 grand for one drone like those used to hunt down al-Qaeda terrorists in the remote tribal regions of Pakistan and Afghanistan. In Augusta, Maine, with fewer than 20,000 people, that's where no officer has been killed in more than 125 years. $1,500 $1, tactical vests. And in Des Moines, Iowa, they got $180,000, two of them, bomb disarming robots. And an Arizona sheriff is now the proud owner of a surplus army tank. This happens all over the place. Uh, TJ, back to TJ Martinell's article in Fargo, North Dakota. The police received a 256 quarter million dollar armored truck with a rotating turret, Kevlar helmets, and assault rifles. That's a bad term, but that's, well, <laughs> and, well, high powered rifles that they, they carry with them as they patrol the streets in their squad cars in Fargo, right? Because Fargo is the anti-terrorism haven. You got to go there to stop the terrorism. Santa Monica here in Southern California, it's a, it's a beach town. It's a huge tourist beach town right on the ocean. Very expensive. Uh, it's a fun place. I like going out there. Santa Monica Police Department uh, earlier this year, so this is probably like five, six years ago, they received nearly $800,000 from the DHS to purchase an automated license plate reading system and equipment in the event of an urban riot. And that same year, 
Concord, New Hampshire, the police filed an application to the DHS asking for over a quarter million to purchase a bear cat. And for those of you who follow Free State Project and the podcast Free Talk Live, for example, you know about the bear cat issue from years ago. It's an armored personnel carrier. What made it all the more disturbing was the police chief's motives claiming they needed it due to the perceived threat of domestic terrorists such as the Free State Project and constitutionalists. Kyle Reese again over on uh, Periscope. For, man, you are nailing it, dude. For your safety? No, for your control. Absolutely. So these are just some examples. There are many, many more. And we also have, and I'm going to link to this, The Intercept did an interesting report. 120, they found a, uh, a confidential 120-page catalog was leaked to them that is passed along from weapons manufacturers, I think in England and elsewhere, to U U.S. law enforcement agencies. They obtained the catalog as part of a collection of, of documents obtained from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. This includes gear that can incept, intercept and monitor cell phone calls and text messages, jam cellular communications, and track the locations of individual phones. So they all kinds of, they have an entire catalog. The U.S. government has an entire catalog of cell phone surveillance devices that this is also part of this. It's not just war on drugs. It's not just asset forfeiture. It's not just gun control. But they are just handing it out like candy, massive amounts of surveillance tools. And TJ sums this up. I know I'm going a little bit longer than normal today, but TJ puts it this way. And this is what I was getting at right at the beginning. While many Americans see police militarization as a local problem, it is merely a symptom. A combination of unconstitutional laws, he writes, flawed foreign policy, and a corrupt use of taxpayer dollars is the real root cause. I mean, if you think about it, if they've got all this military gear, well, maybe they shouldn't be in 100 plus, 150, 170 locations around the world. Maybe they shouldn't be engaged in endless unconstitutional wars for over a century because then they wouldn't have the gear to hand out. So that is part of the root cause as well. It's also, I mentioned earlier, people thinking that this is okay. We need to do a lot of education. And TJ correctly points out, out that while the police departments are to blame for their individual actions, one has to ask what would occur if they stopped receiving these billions of dollars from the feds? Left to local resources, the police would be at the mercy, at least to some degree, uh, would be at the mercy of the taxpayers who suffer the consequences when they get out of line. People ultimately obey those who pay them. And as long as it's the feds funding the police, we can't expect them to listen to us ever. Now, not that they would listen to us on a local level either, but it's far less likely that they'll ever listen to us if they're basically acting as federal agents. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you found it educational. I hope you learned something. I learned something as I review this every single time. Just an FYI, I've got uh, some interviews. I mentioned this in the last episode. I've done a bunch of interviews recently. Tomorrow I'm recording. Uh, yesterday, I think it was, yeah, yesterday, I was on with Robert Scott Bell a week or so ago with Tom Woods. Uh, tomorrow I'm recording the Bob Murphy Show. On Friday, Nick Hankoff has got a new podcast called Come Home America. We're scheduled to do that. And then more coming next week. Just look for interviews on our website if you want to see what other interviews I've done. I try to post as many as I can. But Mike Meharry actually does more interviews than I do lately. So there's a lot of more, a lot of great, interesting content on there. We also have podcasts sometimes that we post from Brian McClanahan, uh, sometimes Joe Wolverton and others. I encourage you to check that all out. I'm going to look through the live chat a little bit later. Unfortunately, I do have to get going and I'm not able to answer some questions right now. I will scroll through those all later. I read through everything. I'm not able to reply to all of them, but I appreciate the feedback, the suggestions for new episodes. If you want to support us, you can do it for free. Smash the like button, subscribe, get notifications, leave reviews on uh, iTunes or whatever. All those, all the platforms you may watch or listen on, they're generally pretty easily triggered. So all that stuff tells the algorithm to show the program to more people. And I would be stupid if I didn't ask. I know it's difficult for everybody, so I don't want anyone to feel pressured. I know some people think that it's a kind of a pressure tactic. I don't want you to feel pressured, but if you can support us financially, we'd be very grateful for that. Our membership program starts out as little as two bucks a month. We make it go a long, long way. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. 
all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members, where you can do that. I see a bunch of people on here who are members already. I don't want to out anybody for being as awesome as they are. If you can't afford it, you're also awesome just for being here. I thank you so much for your support. I'll see you next time here on the path to liberty.